this is the way we should be practicing you know, seeing the pathogens, using salivary diagnostics, getting all the calculus out, yes, but also incorporating the whole body. And let's heal the body because there's a reason that the plaque is dysbiotic and it's not because they didn't brush well. And if we don't look at the whole person, then we're not being the healer we need to be. I want to reduce the bacterial biofilm, the aerosol contamination. I want a healthy environment for my patients. And so, you know, this is the office philosophy. It is, you know, the best that we can do. Why would we compromise, you know, when we have tools? Never stop learning. There's so much information out there. You know, don't settle for what you learned in school because what you learned in school is going to be incorrect or obsolete in 10 years, 20 years. Yeah, this is a tale, a tale, oh yeah, a tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one, bringing the best of dental knowledge, and we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening, and preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning, and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, an Endeavor Business Media production. This is episode number 377, and I am your host, Andrew Johnston. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. And you're going to be so glad that you did not miss this episode because we have brought on the incomparable Barbara Tritz. And I think we're talking about something that's very interesting, maybe a little bit of a hot button topic for a lot of people. We're, talking, we're going to talk about holistic dental hygiene. I was kind of avoiding this type of topic in the past. And, and I think if you know me, I'm not really, I don't mind taking certain risks, but I've been a little bit of risk averse on some topics because I just know they don't resonate with a lot of people. But in retrospect now, I realize how ignorant that was on my end. I feel like I had my own biases when it comes to uh, holistic dental hygiene or what I thought it was, what I'd seen you know, the memes of and the posts about and things like this. And so I just, I don't know. I, I also kind of thought that the people that practice that way were a little bit standoffish, but again, I hadn't had any personal interaction. So all my thoughts, I, it just wasn't fair the way I was kind of portraying this, I guess. So I met Barbara and we had, we talked about different things. We did like a, a pretty good long pre interview sitting down one time in Chicago and Man, I think that she's just one of the most incredible hygienists that ever existed. I mean, I wish we could take away the barriers of the names and things like that because being labeled, I think, it really kind of sucks because it's not really who she is. I found her to be very warm and inviting, incredibly smart, very thorough in how she practices. I mean, I just, I don't know. I feel like she just, as far as the spectrum of what you're allowed to do as a hygienist or what we should be doing, I feel like she is at the top end of that spectrum, things that I wish I could have done with the resources that I wish I had and, and, and all of that. Anyway, so I, I better quit talking her up so well, but she is really amazing. I feel like this topic is, it really has changed the way I view it. And I hope that it does change the way that you view holistic dental hygiene as well. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But next week, we are bringing back a guest that was on several years ago. And I am so grateful that she came back on. We are bringing back Karen Davis. And she's going to give us a different perspective to our lives. We're going to talk about coping with really tough situations. This was one of those times where I wish, I mean, I kind of wish we did. And I'm, I'm kind of also glad that we didn't. But like, we record the segment of the interview, but we do a lot of talking before and after. And it would be so great for you all to hear that. But on the other hand, it's just such a private moment that we shared. And I just, I'm very thankful for Karen. Uh, I Again, I just I'm not really sure how to take that because I, I really want everyone to hear it, but also I'm I'm glad for that private moment. But she's a remarkable human being, and that's probably just not even giving her enough credit. You're gonna really like her episode as well. You'll see what I'm saying about that next week. Don't forget, everyone, we do have CE for several of our episodes. The courses and the exams are posted in something called DACE, D-A-C-E, which stands for Dental Academy of CE. And it's I'll put the website down in the show notes. Uh, there'll be a link in the show note for each episode, so you can go directly to it. And then I'll also start putting the parent link 
so that if you don't remember it, you can bookmark this parent link and you'll see all of the episodes and all the courses that you can take. So each course that you'll see on DACE is related to an episode number that you'll find here on your podcast feed. So you listen to the podcast and then go back to DACE, look over all the questions. We have an amazing CE director, Lacey, and Lacey creates all these questions for you. You answer the questions. Four out of five gets you half a credit of CE. Unless it's a super long episode, maybe we can go to a one full credit, but these are usually half hour long episodes. So don't forget about that. For those of you who have done CE in the past, we used a platform called CE Zoom, and it was the most amazing partnership. A huge thanks to Sarah Thiel for letting us partner with her. She she took a chance early on. There weren't very many dental podcasts doing CE. I don't think there's actually any dental. I think we were the first ones, but you know, she made it happen. She she figured out how to make it work and how that we can get the right accreditation to make sure that we are following all the rules and all of that. And so all of the episodes that we have done recently with CE Zoom are still going to be housed on CE Zoom. If you look in our newsletter once a month, we'll tell you which CE episodes are expiring. And so you'll just need to follow the appropriate links to make sure you get back to those CE episodes. But moving forward, we are definitely going to be working on the DACE platform. So anyway, other than all of that, it's been a relatively quiet week. Obviously, I still have a little bit of that cold going on. I am using my my clear xylitol spray. Hopefully that starts helping. So I'm starting to take some decongestant. Uh, hopefully next week you'll have the regular voice, Andrew. But with that, I hope you enjoy this episode. In fact, I know you will enjoy this episode with Barbara Tritz. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome, everybody, into the interview portion of the podcast. I am joined today by Barbara Tritz. Barbara, I'm so excited to have you on. Wait, I really meant to have you on, well, when we saw each other at AOS, right? We tried to schedule that time. And I'm grateful in a way that we didn't get a chance to record there because I got to pick your brain a little bit and learn a little bit more about you. So I feel a little bit better prepared for this particular conversation. But thank you for making time and thank you for being with me today. I am so excited to share. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. So, Barbara, for our listeners, I mean, I was telling you when we were sitting down, I was like, you know, I'm really surprised even being in the same state, you and I didn't really run in the same circles. And you have so much that you've learned over the years and so, so much to share that I'm kind of surprised I didn't really know you as well as I should have. And so I feel like there might be some of our listeners that are kind of in the same boat that I was. And so if you don't mind just kind of starting off with, you know, your dental background and kind of your journey through dentistry. So I have been a hygienist for a very long time. And so my first year as a hygienist, I worked in an office in Florida and I hated dental hygiene. I had 10 patients a day, 50 patients a week. And by Friday, I was crying in the dark room and I thought, oh my gosh, I have made the biggest mistake of my life. So I lasted for one year, got my one week vacation, moved 2000 miles and put my scaler down and went to grad school. And I was doing dental sales while I was in grad school. And I walked into a dental office that had a face contrast microscope. And I knew just enough to ask, why was the hygienist using this beautiful piece of equipment? And, and they told me, and then I asked for a job there. <laughs> and they gave me a job, thankfully. And it changed my life. Because now I could see the bacteria, and I could be the healer I really wanted to be. So I have never not used a microscope since that first year. And I have my own microscope now, and I work in offices that have a microscope, and it is a game changer. Because once you see the pathogens, then it changes everything you do. Mm -hmm. And so I am a biological hygienist now. I work in a holistic, biologically-oriented, airway-focused practice and I practice with the microscope and non-surgical periotherapy. Also, I use ozone and perioscopy. And it's a, somebody told me it's a unicorn practice. <laughs> and, you know, that's the sad thing is this is the way we should be practicing. You know, seeing the pathogens, using salivary diagnostics, mm -hmm. getting all the calculus out. Yes, but also incorporating the whole body. And let's heal the body because there's a reason that the plaque is dysbiotic. And it's not because they didn't brush well. It's because they're not eating well, they're not breathing well, they're not sleeping well, their immune system is shot. And if we don't look at the whole person, then we're not being the healer we need to be. 
And that's the beauty of biological dental hygiene is that, that we're finally a healer. And that was my goal to go into healthcare was to be a healer. So I love talking about this and sharing it with other hygienists because I want it to be the standard of practice. Okay. So you said a minute ago, you're a biological dental hygienist. And I think well, that term is, I don't, I don't know, kids are saying it's triggering nowadays, right? That's the term. Like it's, it kind of makes someone think about you and kind of pigeonhole you into like a certain persona. And I wanted to kind of discuss that today because your interpretation from what I'm hearing is I am someone who looks at the airway, looks at the sleep, looks at the bigger picture, who is trying to heal on a kind of a grander scale, as opposed to what we have traditionally thought of as dental hygienists of, you know, maybe, you know, scraping teeth, you know, teeth scrapers. And so I kind of wanted to maybe dive into the term biological dental hygienist. Can you explain that just a little bit more of what you are and then what everyone else thinks it might be? So as a biological hygienist, I am looking for the root causes of our dental disease. You know, prehistoric man didn't have a hygienist chasing after him saying floss and brush. Right. So it's not that we have plaque, it's that we have pathological plaque. And we have to ask why we have pathological plaque. And that's where the airway, the nutrition, the lack of nutrition, the, the food that is not food, you know, the processed foods, the preservatives, the, the antibiotics, the glyphosate, the other chemicals, all the things that we're ingesting are, you know, the mouth is the canary in the coal mine for a bigger systemic issue. And we're, the 21st century, we're dealing with chronic disease. So, you know, that's why we're dying is of chronic disease. Sure. And the mouth is just the red flag that there's a problem in the rest of the body. And so as a biological hygienist, I'm looking at working with the ENTs and the allergist and the primary care physician and, and a myofunctional therapist and the cranial sacral therapist and whatever else the patient needs in order to help them on their healing journey. It's not just removing plaque yeah. and, you know, bleeding gums and, you know, bone loss and teeth melting from tooth decay are signs that there's dysbiosis in the body. So as, you know, my biological training is, you know, let's incorporate and collaboration cures, like Ayash says. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have to stop working in a silo. And, you know, having salivary diagnostics and the microscope helps me to help the patient, you know, bring that to their primary care physician and say, okay, we need support here. The immune system needs a recharge. There's nutrient deficiencies. There's, you know, the mitochondria are in dire straits. So how do we work together? Now, I know that most people think of a biological or a holistic hygienist as, you know, we recycle and, and we eat crunchy granola. Um, I am the farthest thing from a crunchy granola person ever. <laughs> you know, I, I recycle only because we have to, sure. but it's not my driving force. But in the office, you know, we, we try to have minimum waste and we, you know, my, my office philosophy is such that, you know, we want to live, you know, have the least impact on the environment. So there is that, but it's not the driving force of the office. Which I it love. is nutrition. It is yeah. airway. It is minimally invasive dentistry. The best dentistry is no dentistry. You know, how do we get our patients healthy mm -hmm. finally mm -hmm. and not just drill holes in teeth? Let me ask this. So you, you mentioned pathological plaque and, you know, the kind of the evolution of man. I, I, where I'm having a hard time with, and I know this is probably like really like a 20 hour course if we were really to kind of dive into <laughs> it for every little aspect. But essentially, are we boiling it down to like it is more pathological than it ever has been in history? And why is that happening like that? You know, about 10 to 12,000 years ago, when man started farming, his diet changed. And that's when the microbiome started to change. And tooth decay went from rare to common. Mm. And it, it was that carbohydrate, that introduction. And so that diet, you know, if you look at Weston Price, he, you know, he's not taught in dental hygiene schools and dental schools. But he did some phenomenal research in the beginning of the 20th century. And he went to isolated communities and looked at 
their tooth decay, their mouth development, and their diet. Mm -hmm. And then he went to neighboring civilized, you know, areas that were close by that were eating your standard American diet. And he charted their tooth decay, their diet, and their malocclusion. And he came to the realization that it was certainly you know, the carbohydrates and the lack of nutrients that were creating this rampant caries and malocclusion and the dysbiotic plaque. So it is our food that, you know, everything comes down to food and breathing. Mm -hmm. And when you feed the bacteria crappy food, you're going to have, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and the plaque becomes dysbiotic then. And there's just too much sugar, you know, and carbs break down to sugar. So we're feeding the bacteria, the, and it's only 1% of the bacteria are pathological or can go rogue. The other 99% are supposed to be there. The yeah. bacteria are actually our friends. Yeah. And the viruses are friends until it turns. And then the bad guys take over. And then the pH drops. And then the bad guys really take over. And then there's no saliva. And it just, it's a downward spiral from there. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. You know, we keep kind of referencing AOSH. And the one that we were at was specifically the hot topics. The collaboration cures is... That event is going to be in, was October? Uh, right? September. September, September in Orlando. Orlando. Yeah. yeah. So if, if any of you listeners are, are trying, kind of curious, like what we're talking about, that's that. The AOSH Hot Topics happened concurrently with Chicago Midwinter here just this last February. And it happens every year at the same time. So as I was sitting through the courses there, I mean, it's referencing everything that you're talking about. The airway, the malocclusion. I was really interested to see um, Dr. Liao, I think it was his first, as, oh, as the no. first speaker. He's awesome. Oh my gosh. Just talking about, and he, and he didn't really get into, you know, like the types of foods that we're eating are so much different and therefore our airway and our arches and all that stuff is being impacted. They didn't talk about that, but he did talk about some of the things that are happening when he is expanding the arches and when he is creating more room for the tongue and, you know, what happens there. And I think this is something that I want every hygienist to be aware of. We're not saying that people are, are garbage and people are doing the wrong things. We're a product of our society, but we definitely need to take a step as a healthcare professional to help offset the problems of the society. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about are going to be some things that are maybe kind of like there's the pros and the cons, like you talked about at the Hot Topics. I do want to talk about fluoride because I do think that it's a little bit controversial you and I had a, a pretty good conversation. I think you know exactly where I stand with fluoride still, but I really want to hear from your side. And then secondly, I'm going to put in the show notes a link to your blog post that is very comprehensive, very, very long. It was called the Fluoride the Destroyer, See the Dark Side. Yeah. Great title, by the way. Great title. But the thing I liked about it, though, is it did go through like every single aspect of fluoride. It goes through the history of it. It went through like how it, you know, fluoride and toothpaste, you know, fluoride and products that we have in dentistry and, and all of that. So it's, it's really comprehensive. So even though we're not gonna be able to talk about it enough to hear, please listeners go check it out over there, but tell me kind of just your, you. your thoughts on fluoride. <sighs> fluoride. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. Do we have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, for years I used fluoride and I believed in fluoride. I really did, mm -hmm. but I was still seeing tooth decay. So I would tell my patients more fluoride, and now you need fluoride trays, and now you need fluoride varnish, and fluoride, fluoride, fluoride. The fluoride wasn't doing the job that we were told it was going to do for me. Mm -hmm. And so I had to look deeper. And once I started looking deeper, I came to the realization that fluoride wasn't the be-all, end-all for me. Mm -hmm. And that I needed to, again, get to the root of the problem, because fluoride was a a Band-Aid at best, and it was hiding deeper tooth decay. Mm -hmm. And so that defeats the purpose. You know, if, if I can find a small cavity on the surface, let's take care of it. But if it's hiding and putting bacteria deeper into the tooth so you have a bombed out tooth underneath, that's not a good thing either. Right. And, you know, we have so many more tools in our toolbox but because we're relying on fluoride, we're not seeing the other tools that are available and getting to the root of the problem. Fluoride is a nutritional deficiency. It is a pH disease. It is acid on the tooth surface. So 
you know, unless we address those issues, we're not going to stop tooth decay. I love it. So that's the short I mean, that's, version. That's, I mean, it's very succinct. It's Well, there was a hygienist that's been on the podcast several times many years ago. Her name is Carrie Ibbotson. She's down in, I believe, California. Yeah. Yep, I and know. She was the, I know Carrie. Oh, you know Carrie. Okay. So she was the first one that probably tried to bring it to my attention when I wasn't listening <laughs> um, about the fact that, look, there are alternatives. There are things that we can do, but even those alternatives, a lot of them are the band-aid that you're talking about. A lot of them are... We're trying to, we say, quote unquote, prevent, but we're not preventing the root cause. As you say, we're preventing maybe at best some of the symptoms that would be coming from that root cause. Um, I want to talk a little bit and maybe introduce our audience if they don't know about it to the next topic, which is ozone. Something that's been also okay. fascinating that I know almost nothing about. If you can give us a rundown of what that is and how, and how it's used. Uh, I use ozone for everything. Ozone gas kills bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses. Periodontal disease is all of those things. Tooth decay is also all of those things. So ozone, it's O3. It's super oxygen. And it just, it disrupts the cell membranes and just annihilates viruses and bacteria and parasites on contact. So I use ozone in my water. We take ozone gas and run it through our, um, make liters of it and put it in our units so that as I'm working with my ultrasonic scaler, I'm getting ozone water. So I'm disinfecting as I scale. Is it also have, disinfecting the water line as it's going through it? Correct. Oh, the nice. water line, when we do our clear pass, I have a photo of our clear pass and they're all clear. There's not one red dot. And so I shared that with Amanda. And, oh, good. Uh, yeah. So Amanda has that photo as well. So it keeps our water lines clean. So, you know, I'm not putting a biofilm back into the patient's mouth. Mm -hmm. And I put it in my air polisher so that I've got ozonated water in there as well. And then as I scale, I oftentimes will put a little bit of ozone oil on my glove and dip my instrument in. So again, I'm not reinfecting a pocket from a previous pocket mm -hmm. um, because the bacteria are mobile. And you know, if we don't clean off our instruments, I have not seen any research, but how can it not be infecting other pockets? Sure. You know, you're planting bacteria in there and viruses and parasites. You know, when I see amoebas on the microscope slide, it's like, whoa, you know, we have bigger issues here. And so the better I can disinfect and, you know, raise the pH so that I can change that microbiome, the better, the healthier the patient is. Okay. So here's my thought on that. So that sounds nice, wonderful. I would love to do that also. What is the cost for ozone type things? Um, so, you know, for about $10,000, you can get a, a workhorse ozonator and, and training. You need to have training to use ozone gas. Mm -hmm. You don't need training for ozone water. You can buy an ozone water unit and just put it in your water lines. You don't need extra training for that. But there is, you know, ozone affects the lungs. Ozone gas does. And so you need to have good training for that. And there are ozone classes, and I can certainly steer people towards that. But ozone oil, ozone water, you don't need extra training. And there are companies that you can buy ozonators from. So, and sorry to sound very, very like simple and basic, but you're yeah. talking about an ozonator is like a unit that would then combine the gas and the water for you and put it into Correct. it. Correct. And yep. then I have a, a beaker and we put distilled water in. And Do you work put, in a laboratory? I mean, you have, no, a, we have, a, you have a beaker. Yeah, well, I know, I know. You're such a dork. <laughs> I am. I am Come a total on. dental geek. I am. Oh, yeah. But we make, you know, we make ozone water in these big glass containers and then put it in all the water lines. And I want to reduce the bacterial biofilm, the aerosol contamination. I want a healthy environment for my patients. Yeah. And so, you know, this is the office philosophy. It is, you know, the best that we can do. Why would we compromise, you know, when we have tools? And then on doctor's side, uh, I assume they use it also for their, you know, 
you know, oh, during yeah. preps Every and things unit. like that. And, yep. and there's, I mean, because it's oxygen, it, it wouldn't interfere with a bonding agent or anything like that, correct? Not at all. Nice. So, you know, after the doctor has prepped the tooth, they always ozone it because there's bacteria in the tooth tubules. Mm -hmm. And the ozone gas permeates into those tooth tubules and into the tissue so that you're disinfecting and having a clean slate. Mm -hmm. you know, without ozone, how do you know that it is truly disinfected? Right. I mean, it's uh, at that point, it's no different than what we talked about, you know, moving your curette from one pocket to the other. You're just moving things yeah. around. Yeah. I would love if you have it, and I, and I can put it in the show notes if you have it, I would love to see a study or something about restorations and you know the efficacy of ozone with restorations if it's like longer duration or uh, incidence of recurrence of decay or whatever okay um, let me let me dig that up for you <laughs> okay <laughs> so let's go back first of all to the microscope because as as you are talking about it i really am in like picturing like this really like going back to micro class and how difficult it's going to be to be able to see the different things going on. So first of all, tell me about when you saw that microscope in that office and you're like, look, this is what you're doing. I want to do that. Did you go to another class to get trained on reading slides again? Or did you remember all of this from micro before? You know, well, I took micro a long time ago and <laughs> there was no live bacteria in that microscope class. <laughs> it was all stained and it didn't make any sense to me because they're all dead. Yeah. They're not moving. But seeing them alive on a phase contrast microscope, I mean, everything is black and white and grays, mm -hmm. and to see it moving and waving and undulating and attacking, it's a totally different world than what we learned in microbiology. Yeah. And to see, you know, spirochetes, and, you know, we know that spirochetes now are causal for dementia. And we know that we create bacteremias. And I've come across a research study that talks about the fact that we are introducing spirochetes to the brain during bacteremic phases of dental treatment. So how can we not be aggressive and know what we're dealing with? You know, dementia is going to triple by the year 2050. Mm. And we play a really important role in helping prevent that statistic. And, you know, 90% of our patients have spirochetes and periodontal disease and at least gingivitis. So, you know, we have an opportunity to change the course of history if we up our game. I love how passionate you are about this. Like this is, <laughs> I can see it in your eye. I feel bad for the listeners. I can't see it. Okay. But let, let's now, like, this is our passion. This is what we believe in. Yeah. I want to flip it on you a little bit and go to the patient perspective because I would assume that the intake and the experience for the patient is different than what they would have done in my previous offices. So maybe starting with like a medical dental history, I would assume yours is maybe a little bit more in depth, but like maybe take me through like the patient step-by-step -step and through like a hygiene appointment. So, I mean, the patients that I see already seek us out. We don't take health insurance or dental insurance and we'll file for them. But so they're already medically compromised, but they have been looking for that support. So I don't, it's not as a big a sell for me as when I worked in a cosmetic practice for sure. 20 years. So, sure. but what I tell my patients is that the best thing that I can do for them is educate. And I have new information and that, you know, I, I've written it up in my website blog and you know, I w that's my job is to help them on their health journey and not just be the cleaning lady. I am their oral health coach and I am part of their health journey team. And we, my goal is to investigate why they have dental disease and to put a, a plan together for them and to work with them and not, you know, I'm not going to lecture them on, on flossing. If they're not a flosser, let's find a better tool. And then, you know, I, I take pH samples and I take nitric oxide samples and I do a carry swab so I know their decay bacteria load. And then I take a plaque sample from under their gums so that we can see their gum disease bacteria load. And then we have information so that I can put together a custom home care program for them. 
And so that at this point they're enrolled and they want to see their slide. And every time they sit in their chair, their first question is, are we going to do a slide today? <laughs> Absolutely. And most of the time I've already got it done because I'm taking that plaque sample as I'm doing my oral cancer screening. Yes. And, and so it's done and I put it to the side of the tray. Then I use disclosing solution and a, an optergate and I have a tricolor disclosing solution so that I see old plaque as purple, new plaque as pink, and acidic plaque as baby blue so that I know how acidic that plaque is on the tooth structure. Mm. So important. You know, if you can't see it, you can't adjust it, you can't fix it, you can't help it heal. And that's where, you know, having the right tools is so important. And, you know, dental hygiene, we are healers and we are educators and we, we are the crux of the office. And not having the right tools in your hand means that you're scaling, you know, you're healing with one hand behind your back. You're not being as effective as you can and should be. Yeah. So, you know, having the best tools you possibly can is so critical. So then I'll use the air polisher right afterwards. You know, I, I do oral hygiene with the Optrigate and the disclosing solution. Then I will do my air polisher so that I'm removing all of that plaque. And all I have left is calculus. And then I do my ultrasonic scaling. I'll go back through and hand scale to check my work because I love my hand scalers. And then we'll go look at the microscope slide. And then at that point, you know, the patient has already seen if they have bleeding gums and they know, you know, a little bit about what I'm going to recommend for home care. We see the microscope and then I wrap it all up together. I've put together what I call an oral health fitness report. So, you know, here are all the things that I did. Here's what we see on the microscope. Here's your risk level, and here's your home care, and here's your homework, and I want you to read this book, and I want you to go to this website, because the patient has to be enrolled, right? and we can't just say, I'll see you in six months, when there's spirochetes and infection and chronic disease. We have to step up our game as a profession, and we have the best tools, and it's so exciting. This is the best time to be a hygienist. <laughs> It is. I love being a hygienist. It's like a whole nother and, level of practicing though, that, that a lot of us and, probably can't even envision, honestly. Well, and that's the sad thing is, you know, the opportunity is there, but as a profession, we need to investigate it. And, and then we need to enroll the dentist in this. You know, so many hygienists come up and say, well, my doctor would never let me do this. Oh, like, yeah. well, you know, then, then find another doctor. Because I have so many dentists at the IAOMT, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, who are just dying to have this level of hygiene and have the hygienist be enrolled and engaged. And so it's both ways. Man, gosh. this. So if I was to go back to like clinical practice day in, day out, this is what I would want. Yeah. It's, it's this level. Because you get to be a little bit of a detective. You get to partner with the patients the way that they need to. The tailored slash customized care is the most important thing for me because not everything's going to work for everybody and we have to figure it out, right? I think also the fact that we have, or you all have, you know, a patient that is already kind of pre-enrolled before you enroll them into it as, yeah. as a partner in this speaks volumes because they're going to probably follow through with a lot of that care also. They do. So I'm, I'm a little bit jealous by what's happening. We touched very briefly when we talked before about perioscopy. I know that you're, that's still something that's a little bit you're working on getting more skilled in, but can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? So for me, I bring a patient back on a separate day and they are the only patient in my column and we anesthetize and we go in with a little camera and find the calculus and then with my left hand, I'm holding the camera, and my right hand, I'm holding the scaler, and I'm looking at a screen so that I'm watching myself just, you know, and sometimes it's, I feel like I'm back in hygiene school. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you're, you're driving backwards. Yeah, exactly. Um, but watching that piece of calculus just come off as you see it on the screen, because you've got to get the calculus off. The, the calculus, we can't just sterilize the calculus. Right. It is a sliver. 
but you can't feel it at that microscopic level, but seeing it, you just can just take it right off and move on so that you're not overscaling, which I love because otherwise blind scaling, it, you're leaving stuff behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the endoscope perioscopy should also be standard of care. I, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I have a few friends that do it and, and they talk about how amazing it is and how, you know, it's, yeah. I, it really is. It's, I think we have several different, I guess, tools in that, that are kind of next level EMS, the airflow. I think that that's like a, yeah. a really amazing thing as well. We talk about that on the show all the time. I'm sure the listeners are tired of that one, but, uh, but oh, it, you know, there's these so, things that are finally available tool. to us though. Right. And that I would love for us to have all of this really cool. Like this should be like the standard in all of, you know, operatories, but it's just not. Yeah. All right. So the last question I have is uh, we talked a little bit about the evacuation system. You remember that? Yeah. And this is to me, this is the one where hygienists and dental professionals and maybe even patients look at that one picture that, you know, yeah. of everyone having that, you know, the big hood and all these different things. Yeah. So I want you to talk to me a little bit about that and, and explain the the protocols and the reasons behind it. Okay. So we do safe mercury amalgam removal techniques and mercury vapor is toxic. And you take a drill to a tooth, you are creating mercury vapor. The mercury vapor affects not only the patient, but also the practitioner, the assistant, and the rest of the office. So you've got mercury floating. And so many dentists have neurologic illnesses, heavy metal toxicity. And mercury goes into the brain, and it contributes to dementia. And, you know, ALS and Parkinson's, it affects the brain. And we have to protect our brains as a profession, and we have to protect our patients. So we use that, that big elephant hose with every mercury removal technique because it is that important. You know, if you broke a thermometer in a school, you would evacuate that school, you would treat it as a hazmat situation. The amount of mercury that we are removing is as great uh, or greater than what is in that thermometer. And mercury vapor is toxic. You know, every time we brush our teeth with mercury fillings, or every time we polish, we're releasing mercury vapors. So I don't polish mercury fillings. I was I, just going to ask that. So it, for I your don't. procedures, then you don't yeah. necessarily have that big suction. I, I don't. Okay. In I, During COVID, I did. Sure. And then it was like, this is so noisy. And, <laughs> you know, but I've got good sure. evacuation yeah. it, with my protocols. Yeah. But we only, the doctor has that big evacuation system. And, but they wear, you know, a hazmat, they wear a respirator and they cover the patient and the patient is breathing oxygen through their nose. And then we are suctioning with that big hose right in front of their face so that we are getting the least amount of mercury vapors in the air and that it gets filtered through the system. But, you know, we have to be safe and we have to pay attention to the toxins that we are creating. Sure. I think one of the big misunderstandings for it is you see the picture on social media and you're thinking, yeah. oh, that's what every hygiene appointment is. Like no. I can't go into a, an operatory in a hazmat suit for essentially a profi. Like that's, that's not yeah, something, no. I, you know, it's not practical. I, no, so. it, and it isn't practical. But what you're seeing is safe mercury removal. We call it the smart technique. Yeah. So it's safe mercury amalgam removal technique. And so we get all the mercury out and then we clean up the room and then we restore the teeth because it is a hazmat, you know, it, it all goes in the hazmat place. I love this. I love what you're doing. I think that you're a phenomenal and very intelligent individual. What last maybe words would you have for, you know, the hygienists that are out there, whether they're new grads or whether they're established? You know, never stop learning. I've been doing this a long time and I, every day I learn something new and I just say, why didn't I know that? Why did yeah. it take me all these years? There's so much information out there and you know, don't settle for what you learned in school because what you learned in school is going to be incorrect or obsolete in 10 years, 20 years. It is. So keep learning. 
Yeah. My goal is 100 CE credits a year. Yeah, wow. That's, and, that's a lot. <laughs> and well, it is, but you know, it's inv I'm investing in myself and my patient's health. Mm -hmm. And how do I improve myself if I don't keep learning? And you know, I want to be a better hygienist tomorrow than I am today. And I love giving that information to patients. Man. And that's why I, I write, you know, so that they have information to answer their questions. And where can they find your blog and how might they reach out to you if they had any questions for you? So my blog is queenofdentalhygiene.net. And I have a contact form on there. And then my email address is on there. Awesome. So they are welcome to email me at any point. I'm happy to share. And, you know, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology has a biological hygiene accreditation program so that they can learn a lot about safe protocols because there's so many toxins in our dental world and they need to be safe. Their patients need to be safe. And let's keep growing this profession. It is the best time to be a hygienist. I agree. I agree. Thank you so much for being on. Your absolute pleasure as always. And I hope, I really hope that some people reach out to you. I hope so too. I, I would welcome it. So thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is a tale, a tale, oh yeah, a tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one, bringing the best of dental knowledge, and we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening, and preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning, and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists.